Um, Rebecca Fuhrer has has been in charge of 80 million, and that may be a slight exaggeration, but not by too much. Educational projects in Connecticut for Connecticut Humanities Council, for CT Humanities and whatever else it's been called over the years. But she's managed some magnificent work and done some magnificent work. And the thing that she's here to talk about today is the project of, that has been already referenced but the Teach It Project, which if you're doing US history at any level, we suggest strongly A, using inquiry and B, using Connecticut models, using Connecticut examples, using Connecticut events. And um, Teach It does that masterfully, combining the two. Here's Connecticut and here's inquiry. So Rebecca's gonna come in and talk um, about the teaching, about the Teach It program. Uh, Rebecca, thanks for coming in. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and, and Tony for having me today. Uh, it's great to be here and I recognize a lot of familiar faces and names, but for those who don't know me, um, I am again, Rebecca Fuhrer and I work as a program consultant for Kinetic Humanities on this teachitct.org project. Um, can you just give like a little wave or pop something in the chat if you're already familiar with um, Teach It? Okay, <laughs> I just don't wanna, wanna be rehashing too much for everyone. Uh, but Teach It is one of those um, resources that's great for both educators who are looking to find ideas for inquiry-based activities that are built around Connecticut stories and Connecticut sources and also for those who are looking for a vehicle to share their own successful classroom activities with other educators, whether those educators are um, in Connecticut or beyond. So hopefully there'll be something for everyone in our time together today. Uh, I'm gonna bring up the uh, site now, but I'm also gonna make sure that we have some time to, um, Okay, is everyone seeing that? Yes. Um, I wanna make sure that we have some time for everyone to also explore within the context of this uh, session um, during, during the time today. So Teach It is a collaborative website from Connecticut Humanities, which is intended to help teachers bring, again, Connecticut history, geography, civics, uh, into the classroom. And it was originally developed to support what were then the new Connecticut social studies frameworks. And that's why there is the focus on grades three, four, five, eight, and high school, which is where Connecticut and US history show up in the frameworks. Um, but that is not to say that there aren't things here that I hope will be adaptable for instance, for our first grade teachers out there, for, for teachers who are doing um, much more uh, uh, local stories as, as well with younger elementary. And, and we'll have a chance to chat about some of those as we go along. Uh, you will see that right from the homepage here, everything is sorted by grade level. And when you click through to any of these, sections, you will see right there links to the related Connecticut social studies frameworks. Right now, of course, these days Teach It is working hard to align with the forthcoming social studies standards and also to expand and diversify the content on the site, which includes but is not limited to providing more resources for educators who are teaching the new Black and Latino studies elective. Um, so each of the, the grade level sections of the website will offer you a list of inquiry activities that already exist on the site. They are listed here along with the compelling question that they address. So again, you know, apropos of our morning conversations about inquiry, this is definitely a, a guided inquiry model, although we know that that there are gonna be places within these activities for students to develop their own questions um, and supporting questions as, as they work their way through these classroom inquiries. 
Um, if I could also just get a sense maybe in the chat of uh, what grade levels folks are teaching, that would be great. I'm gonna pause that share. And okay, so I see it great. This just so that I have a sense of the range. I'm seeing a little bit of everything. That's great. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, and how many of you are already using Connecticut primary sources in the classroom? So I know that's a sort of specific specific question, but Tony, I'm shocked. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Um, you'll find that Teach It, let's see if we can keep going with our share here. Teach It is divided primarily into two main sections. So the first is our primary source galleries. These are a newer section of the site. So there aren't that many of them yet, but there are plans to expand this area as well. Um, these are curated galleries of sort of raw primary source material that you can use to drive inquiry, or that could be a question focus if you're using um, QFT, the question formulation technique in the classroom or something similar to that. I know uh, Steve is gonna talk about QFT a little bit later on. So these are, the idea behind these is that these are sources that are related to a single theme, but can be used in a very flexible way in the classroom. So you just would pick a gallery, for instance, here's a gallery on women's history in Connecticut. You'll notice um, when we talk about uh, encouraging students to evaluate their sources, where does your source come from? Is this a reliable source? Uh, we are very careful about always providing the full title, the um, link wherever possible to the archive or museum or library that holds the primary source so that students and teachers can always trace the source back to its original repository. Um, and then these are done as a gallery. So you can just grab a source and use it in your classroom. Uh, but again, these primary source galleries don't provide any additional instructional guidance. This is sort of to, to use, to find and use some Connecticut resources that would help support what you're already doing in your classroom with something that was a local topic. The bulk of what is on Teach It are the, the uh, grade level inquiry activities. And so we'll go into these. Let's see, we'll pick high school just for section to look at. So uh, these activities, although they provide a lot more guidance in terms of how to lead an inquiry in the classroom, and they do provide primary sources to use, can of course be used in any way that you like in the classroom. I mean, we offer suggestions, but you can pick and choose the resources. You can pick and choose parts of an activity that you would like to use. Um, these activities are all developed by a combination of classroom teachers, library media specialists, historical organizations, museums, independent historians, uh, and then our own staff develop some as well. Everything that is submitted to us is reviewed prior to publication. We work through um, the activities with, with the developers so that we make sure that they have, for instance, really great compelling questions, that the sources are providing the tools that we want to provide to students to help work their way through those questions, um, that we have the permissions that we need to publish anything that's used on the site. So. I was going to use, and since she's not on the call anymore, we can, can embarrass her as much as we want. Allison Norrie's uh, recent activity that we published on Mary Townsend Seymour, uh, Hartford advocates, ad, activist fights for equity. 
just as a sample to walk you through. And I know this morning someone asked about uh, templates and a, or a framework for how lesson plans could or should look, um, inquiry lessons should look. And so I will walk you through the template that we use for Teach It, which is just one, one example, um, but it is all uh, built around the inquiry arc. And you'll see that as we go through. So first of all, all of our lessons begin with a little teacher snapshot at the top. That's going to um, provide the sort of keywords or the overarching topics and themes. The themes are all connected to the Connecticut State Frameworks. It'll tell you what grade level or grade levels we think the activity is appropriate for. And if the activity links to any specific Connecticut towns, those will be listed uh, here under the town listings. So it might just say statewide overarching, but if there are specific towns that are mentioned, those will be mentioned there. We always offer a few little paragraphs of historical background, and that is on the assumption that some of these activities are going to be about topics that the teacher might not be immediately familiar with. So it gives a little bit of guidance although there are always additional resources at the bottom of the page as well to help build out your sort of historical uh, knowledge of the of the topic or the time period. All right, then we get into the inquiry arc. So here we are with, with D1 um, looking at the compelling questions, compelling and supporting questions. And again, we always we always frame these as potential compelling questions or supporting questions. We know that that teachers and their students are going to work through some of their own. Uh, but we always like to have compelling questions whenever possible that are, as we talked about this morning, very open ended. They don't have a single answer. In many cases, they are going to be transferable to different time periods or historical content. So it's not going to be specific to the topic necessarily. For instance, this one is about Mary Towns and Seymour. The compelling question isn't going to ask about Mary Towns and Seymour. It's much broader. And the hope is that it's something that will hook students in and make them interested. So in this case, in what ways have communities of color advocated for equity? Then your supporting questions, you know, we, we offer a few to sort of get the get the ball rolling and those might be specific to the to the content that you're looking at. Then we launch into D2, so applying the disciplinary con, um, concepts and tools. In this case, that section is structured as a toolkit of primary sources that teachers and students can use in the classroom. Uh, maybe some of you have had trouble in the past finding uh, primary sources that are age appropriate for the grade level that you're working with. Obviously, this activity, which is for high school, uses some original letters um, that might not be appropriate for for elementary students, but we have a lot of activities. We always encourage the use of photographs, of images, maps, cartoons. And those things are really great for all ages and they don't rely on a particular reading level. So, so whenever possible, we encourage activity developers to have a variety within their, um, within their activity. One thing we're also very passionate about is, although I of course love to put original handwritten documents into the hands of students, um, I never want poor handwriting from you know the 18th century or the 19th century or the 20th century to stand in the way of students understanding the content. So we also always provide typewritten transcriptions as well. Teachers can decide to use that however they want, but we do provide them. So here are our various uh, resources that are available. In this case, we've got two letters and a um, newspaper article. Um, I, I'm sorry, the, um, someone's asking about when I mentioned primary sources. Um, in this case, we are talking about original historical materials from the time period that we are discussing. 
So that's the differentiation. Um, so there's your, your toolkit. That's sort of your approach to D2. And then you get into the, the D3, the, the analyzing and the actual evaluating of the sources. And this is where we provide just a little bit of guidance. Sometimes this is not a matter of reinventing the wheel. Um, we always encourage activity developers to draw on techniques or graphic organizers that they've used in the past that have been successful. Um, in this case, Allison has used the Library of Congress primary source analysis tool worksheet, which is a great, it's a great tool. It works for all ages. Um, and it's sort of a, what do you see? What do you think? Uh, what do you still wonder about? Or what do you question? Um, framework for looking at primary sources and then ways to bring it together and, and sort it out. You'll notice that these inquiry activity sections for the most part are very short. These are supposed to be quick activities. In many cases, it could just be a piece of a lesson and it's not a full curriculum unit on, on a particular historical time period. Some of our activities do get a little bit closer to that <laughs> and then we'll have many pieces, but very often they're just little quick things based on uh, a small uh, assortment of primary sources. Then for D4, there's always gonna be a section on communicating conclusions and taking informed action. Um, someone this morning shared our lesson that we did on um, uh, kids in, in early Connecticut. And in that case, we were suggesting a bubble, uh, a double bubble graph or a Venn diagram comparing and contrasting. These could be anything from, you know, writing a letter to a legislator to creating an educational video, um, but it is a place often where we encourage students to pull together the past and the present um, in, some, in some way. And then, as I mentioned at the very top, we always offer some additional uh, resources for, these are mostly for teachers, but in some cases they're for the teachers to use with their students as well. So it might be places to go in Connecticut, uh, additional things that you could do, which would be different. I know our friends from the uh, Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame are here. So uh, their video on Mary Townsend Seymour made it into the things to do in this activity. Um, websites to visit and then additional articles to read. Uh, many of these articles will come from our partner website, which is also from Connecticut Humanities, ConnecticutHistory.org. These are nice, short uh, essays about Connecticut history that are written for a general, um, a general population. So they're they're easy to um, easy to uh, read and, and quick reads, and always connect to Connecticut history. So, so that's sort of a quick overview. Um, what I want to do now is take just a, a little bit of time. Let's see, my clock says it is 1.11. Let's take um, 10 minutes and everybody who, you know, isn't already muted and video off can feel free to do that. And I'd love for everyone to take a few minutes to take a look at the site find the section that best aligns with the grade level or the grade levels that you teach and poke around a little bit on some of the activities that are there. Um, see if there's an activity that already addresses a topic that you're, that you're already teaching or something that you've thought about that you might like to teach, um, or maybe an activity that addresses a topic uh, that you never knew about before this. Um, and then take a look down and see what kinds of primary sources are in the toolkit. Are any of them already familiar to you? Um, or are you using something similar, but maybe isn't a Connecticut source? And here would be a great way to bring in some Connecticut history into the classroom or geography or civics. Um, and also, do you think your students would actually find these types of sources engaging and, and, a, and good meat for, for an inquiry? Um, so it is, yeah, it's 112. Let's take until 122, and then we will um, come back. And I will pop the address right here so that you can link, link right to it. Yeah. 
I get it right? I hope so. There we go. Okay. See everyone in 10 minutes. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, so um, hopefully this gave everyone a little bit of chance to sort of see more about what is currently on the site. Did anyone have any observations or thoughts they wanted to share? Something you saw that was already connected to something you're already teaching or something that piqued your interest that, that uh, you might not have known about before? You know, one thing, <clears throat> there was so much on there that was really interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I have a, I guess, an affinity for um, geography of food and uh, <laughs> distribution of food and access to food and what have you. I think it's a really important issue. Well, fortunately, I'm not teaching any classes that it fits in. So I only like looked at it quick and then I, 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 I looked away. But um, one of the uh, things that I looked at that was connected to something I'm teaching, which is um, the, uh, I just wanna to flip to it real quick so I don't say the wrong thing. The one about um, Connecticut uh, uh, ratifying the constitution. And it was, it was really interesting because I loved all the additional resources um, that I just didn't know that we had access to in one spot. You know, normally I would have to go around and I would have to search as much as I can. And then who's got time to go into the, the newspaper database when you're trying to plan a lesson that week. But I loved how everything was right here. It had the call for the convention. Uh, it has some uh, writings from Roger Sherman, who I think is um, particularly important, especially since he signed all the documents, all the early documents, which I think is great. And um, there's just so, so many different resources that are on here. I mean, we have the uh, Connecticut Current, we have the Hartford Current, we have, oh, the Connecticut and Hartford Current, the same, my fault. We have the, uh, what are some other ones that are on here? Um, anyway, there's all different types of, of primary sources that are just wonderful to integrate into the classroom. So thank you for that. Um, also, I'm just, I'm gonna, pick on Ed, who I see also joined us. Um, Ed Dorgan has also developed a number of activities for Teach It, including two just last uh, fall that were related to the um, Connecticut, the Hartford Convention, Hi Ed, <laughs> Hartford Convention, and the uh, War of 1812. And I know he's using those topics in the classroom because my daughter had him for social studies this past, this past year in grade eight. So, um, another another expert uh, teach it activity developer here on the here on the chat as well. Um, anyone else had anything that they wanted to wanted to touch base about or ask a question about for that matter? Okay. Great. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen again. There we go. Um, so obviously, there is a lot of content already on the site. Um, but contributing activities is also a fairly easy process. And you can it's a great way to share something you're already doing with your students or to use it as an excuse to develop something new, uh, particularly with a Connecticut focus great way to wow your colleagues and your and your administrators and maybe even make a little bit of a little bit of money on the side as Connecticut Humanities right now has a very generous gr uh, grant from the Scripps Foundation to provide a limited number of stipends to educators to develop activities for teach it from now through the end of 2022 so something to keep in mind if you're feeling like maybe you have something that you would like to share uh, if you have something you would like to share with other educators, you just go to this build it section and click on contribute an activity that will take you right to this page that has like a little it has a little video that sort of walks you through the template and the process. 
but it is also where you can, if you already have your activities sort of fairly fully developed, you can download the um, template that we use right there. Uh, this is a little bit old school, so you can download the template as a PDF or as a Word document and you can fill it out and submit it via email or submit a link to it via email either way. Um, but this will walk you through sort of all of the pieces that you need really for any inquiry activity, but in this case to make sure that you're aligned to the Teach It format. So the title uh, should be brief, but it should be clear what the activity is about. Then you can go through and identify which are the grade levels that, that your activity aligns to, and you can pick more than one, um, more than one grade level as well. Here we have a lot that go between, say, three and four, or three and five, or five and eight, um, or eight in high school. So uh, because most of the activities are fairly flexible and adaptable. Um, so it's more sort of where they align to the frameworks and the forthcoming standards. And you go down and you'll sort of identify the theme or themes. These again are aligned to the current frameworks. You'll put in some of your search terms here and we'll do our best to align them to other search terms that we're using the topics so that so that teachers can link them together with other activities on the site that are related. Again, if it touches, if your activity touches upon a specific town, you would list those towns here. You do your little historical background, a paragraph or two. You think about a compelling question that you could propose and some supporting questions that you can propose. Again, students and teachers are gonna work these through themselves, but this is just to give folks a starting place. For the resources, and we'll talk about where to find great primary resources in a minute, um, there is no specific requirement for a specific number of resources for a teach it activity. You could have a great activity that's built around one source. You could also have an activity where you really want to bring in, uh, let's say, eight sources, but you're going to break them up and have students work in groups where they're looking at different sources in each group or something like that. So there are different ways to do it. Or for instance, the um, kids in early Connecticut uh, visual literacy activity that that was mentioned this morning, you know, that has a whole gallery of images that you could use, but the activity is always the same. So you can pick a different source to use each day and do it over the course of a week if you were interested in doing that. So that's why it says one source is required, the others are optional. Then again, just a few sort of bullet points of how- Could I ask you one oh, question? I'm sorry, yes, of course, Steve. Um, how about if somebody has a brilliant idea for an inquiry, yep. but has no idea of what the sources would be, yep. would you, someone would work with them on that? Yes. In fact, here, I'll just scroll down here a little bit. I'm sorry. Bit. I, I yeah, was wondering no. if you were going to say that. But. No, that, no. But the, since you've brought it up, if you don't, if exactly, exactly what Steve's saying, if you have an idea, but you don't know exactly what the sources are, or alternatively, you know of a great source, but you can't quite figure out how to propose using it, um, you can use this little online form, or you could email me directly. I'll be sure to put my email in the chat towards the end here. And we are happy to work through with folks um, to sort of flesh out ideas like that. You do not have to come to us with something fully formed. It is a very collaborative process. Okay, so let's see. Sorry I wrecked the vibe there. But... No, no, not at all. Um, oh, great. Uh, okay, so so again, sort of bullet pointy guidance for how to guide the inquiry in the classroom, and then a few ideas for ways to communicate conclusions or take informed action. We ask everyone who develops Teach It activities to provide at least two options, um, preferably really different kinds of options, like maybe one is a writing response and one is a creative art response or one is a 
making a video and one is, uh, you know, proposing a campaign within your school or within your community. The idea being that more options here will help teachers find something that will work for them or inspire them to think of something that will work for them. Again, two are required, additional ones are welcome. And then we do ask our developers to help identify additional resources, although I very often help folks uh, flesh this section out. Um, if you know of places to go where you could do a tour either with students or, or even suggest for folks to do on their own, um, additional things that you might do that are related to this topic, some websites that are great resources, some articles that help fill out the background information. Um, any of that is welcome. And then, of course, just your contact information. So that's that's sort of the framework that we use to plug into, into the site. And then you just email those templates back in. Again, I will, um, the, the address is right here, but I'll also put my personal um, work address in the in the chat towards the end um <clears throat> so if you're still sort of struggling with wh where would i get started in this if i wanted to develop something whether whether it's something to submit for teach it or not just an inquiry to develop for your classroom um it's an interesting question because sometimes i start with a compelling question that i have in mind but sometimes i just start with a really great historical source and go from there in a way almost work my way backwards you know thinking this is a great source that kids could really get into um, what does it help us uh, understand so if you're wondering where to look for primary sources that are related specifically to Connecticut um, there are tons of places, but there's some great online repositories that you can start with. And if you don't know about those, I just wanted to introduce some of them briefly. So the first is, oh my goodness, I'm now having hail on my skylight. So it's a little, <laughs> it's a little loud. Um, sorry. The first is the Connecticut Digital Archive, also referred to as CTDA. Um, and I'll pop all of these links into the chat as well. The CTDA uh, brings together digital collections from dozens of Connecticut museums, libraries, historical societies, archives, all in one place. Um, you can search all their collections if you are coming from a certain town want to look for someplace that was geographically close to you, you could do that. Um, I have many years of experience working at the Connecticut Historical Society. So sometimes I look directly there for something that I'm thinking of. And you can type in, I don't know, let's use a place this time. Kent, Connecticut. Um, but you can use really any, any topic. And here are, of course, I'm gonna pull up things that are directly related to the town of Kent and also to anything with, I guess, the name Kent in it. Um, so here are the sources. You can make them full screen. You can zoom into them. Um, they're really wonderful. And anything that is on the CTDA, we have permission to use on Teach It. So that's that's an easy repository to look at. And I just wanted to show as an example, then you can always sort by material type of oh, the solo only has one type, but if there were maps, if there were um, other types of materials, those would show up on the side here. Um, and then there are other filters along the side as well. So Connecticut Digital Archive is a great, is a great resource. Um, then, oh, I'm bringing up, there we go. Uh, Library of Congress, which I'm sure many are familiar with, and they do some really excellent teaching with primary sources programs and have some wonderful resources. I mentioned their, um, their primary source analysis worksheet earlier that we always encourage folks to, to use. Um, if you aren't familiar with those, you get to all of those resources through the teacher section of the Library of Congress website. 
Um, but you can search this collection. You can search the entire collection of the Library of Congress. You could search for a specific medium. Um, and then you can, let's see, let's see if this, um, and then you can also sort and filter really effectively on the Library of Congress site. So here I've looked for suffrage, but if I wanted to specifically look at materials from Connecticut, you can sort by location. Um, they are unfortunately in the order of frequency. So sometimes you have to look a little bit, but anyway, so, so it's very, it's very sortable. You can sort by time period. Um, uh, within, within these dates, you can then get into smaller date ranges as well. So Library of Congress, another great site. Again, anything that is already in the digital realm on the Library of Congress uh, site we can use on Teach It. So another great place to look for materials. The National Archives, again, has a lot of official records. Um, so that's a great repository as well. And one that I just wanted to share, um, you might think of historic newspapers as being a, a type of source that is really better for high school, and certainly we use them more frequently with high school students. Um, but there are wonderful things in historic newspapers, advertisements, and and um, all sorts of little like local history, you know, snippets that we use throughout Teach It. Um, this is the Library of Congress's historic newspapers project, and they bring in thousands and thousands of page, uh, newspaper pages. And in particular, they work here in Connecticut with the Connecticut State Library's Digital Newspapers Project. So if you wanted to look specifically at Connecticut newspapers, you just filter here uh, to Connecticut, and then you can say, I'm interested in things that happened in the time period, uh, let's say around the Civil War. So we're going to say 1860 to 18, let's say 65. You can then also put in specific terms that you want to search for. It will bring up the individual pages. If you put in a search term here, it will actually highlight in red on the page where your search term shows up, which makes searching a whole lot easier than having to read through the entire newspaper page. Um, so as you look through Teach It, I think you'll see a lot of uh, creative ways that historic newspapers have been have been used. And of course, there are other repositories, other ways to access historic newspapers. The Historic Hartford Current is accessible to Connecticut residents through the Connecticut State Library with your library card number. Um, and there are other great newspaper repositories as well, but but this one is um, is pretty amazing. Rebecca, is the oh, yeah. uh, is is the Connecticut slash Hartford Current available all the way through? Um, on the historic Hartford Current site, yes, all yes. the way back to its first publication in the 1760s. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, there are all the not online, non-digital um, sources, your local museums, your libraries and historical societies. Some of these, of course, do have um, digital materials online, and some are online through the Connecticut Digital Archive, um, but others are not yet. And so if you're interested in a local topic, um, or you just want to hear more about what the local stories are that might be interesting. Um, you should seek out the folks at your local public library might have a local history room or the local historical society. Um, these folks, whether they are staff or volunteers, as Steve mentioned earlier, are very often very eager to work with educators and to share what they have and what they know. Uh, so if you get in touch with them and you explain what you're looking for, or, or often they can even help you 
even if you don't know what you're looking for. You say, here's what I'm doing. And they can, they can often offer a lot of great, great advice. And I will say also, if you had um, a small organization that had some great resource, but that was not digitized, um, there are a couple of options for doing that. I mean, one is as long as you have permissions from the from the organization, uh, an iPhone photo is often good enough these days to really zoom in and, and see a source in detail. Uh, but if it was a place that was not comfortable with that uh, or that um, didn't have resources to do that, Connecticut Humanities can also help with reaching out to those organizations and digitizing anything you would be interested in using on a, on a Teach It activity. So don't feel like just because it's not digital or not digital yet, you, you couldn't find a way to use it. So those are some of the repositories. And so what I was really hoping, <clears throat> I know we have just a few more minutes, but what I'd love is if everyone would take just a few minutes and check out one or a couple of these repositories and, um, and see if you can locate something that would fit in again with something you're interested in possibly teaching in the classroom, um, something you know that you've been wondering about. Um, and so I'm gonna pop these in, that's the Connecticut Digital Archive, the Library of Congress, And, and if you don't have anything in mind, um, then just, you know, put your, put your town in there. See, see if you can find some cool local history nugget that your students might find interesting. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So I know Teach It is devoted to local mm -hmm. history. Um, our, our team at Advance, we're supporting curriculum development um, for all grade levels. And um, I'm just wondering about grade six and seven with world geography. Are there similar resources? Right. right. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a, a lot group. about American and local history, uh, and I, I'm just been I've I've just been uh, keeping my ears and eyes open for resources related to grade six and seven. Right. No, that's a that's a legitimate question, and and because that's never been our focus, I don't have as much to offer you on on that front. Um, and in fact, I found when we when we made a real effort last year to add more geography content to the site. I was having a tough time finding good geography sources, um, whether they were for Connecticut or elsewhere. Um, and then in terms of the world history, I mean, obviously from our perspective, it might be a stretch on your end, you know, to link into world history topics. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know anything off the top of my head that does sort of a similar thing. Rebecca, could history. I say? Yeah, Steve, you probably yeah, know better yeah, than well, I do. I'm working with a couple of districts that I've done PD with recently right now to compile a list of six and se specific six and seventh grade documents. So if somebody, whoever just asked that question, just type your name and, and, uh, and email into the, I'll make sure you get the information that we're, uh, that we're compiling. And I would agree it's, it's, we're finding it to be much more of a challenge for six and seven to find mm -hmm. appropriate primary source resources than there would be to teach like AP US history or something like that. Right. But Tracy, I do just want to draw your attention to Jennifer put a link in the chat also that might help you on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, great. Okay, in the midst of that, has anyone had a chance to sort of poke around a little bit?
sometimes it's a little bit of a black hole and can disappear <laughs> too. Um, great. And Sam, I did make a note. I'm, I will be in touch. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, anyway, I know that we are um, getting a little bit short on time because you still have things on the agenda today, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of Teach It as a source. We've been around a long time, but we are definitely still, you know, gaining awareness. Um, it has been a big help having this grant from the Scripps Foundation over the past two years has enabled us to, I don't know, quadruple the number of activities on the, on the site or something like that. Uh, what we have also found is that since the beginning of the pandemic, the um, usage of the site has not surprisingly shot way, way up. And in part, I think that's because of more, uh, you know, teachers looking for more sort of remote options. Uh, but I think it is also because we are offering resources to teach the kind of history that is now being challenged in some, in some parts of the country. So we see our um, visitation going up from all around the United States and actually even abroad, not just from within Connecticut. Uh, so again, I encourage you, if you're looking to get into using inquiry a little bit more in your classroom and you just need some ideas, some resources, some pointers, it's a, a great resource for that. If you are um, looking to share something that you're already doing, uh, we would love to help you do that. So I'm going to now just put my contact information into the chat so that... Uh, and, and Rebecca? Yeah. I wanted to mention okay, that um, yes. <laughs> I got into this late. I was busy with for something for my son, but um, is it's just a great resource for bringing in about when you're teaching U.S. history, um, that bringing in local Connecticut history uh, is just something that is easier to tie it in. It can help motivate students. Um, and it just, whenever we can, it just ties it right back to the frameworks, which is what, uh, you know, again, to uh, teach Connecticut history, uh, to infuse it into learning about U.S. history. Thanks, Ed. And I popped my, um, both my direct email and the Teach at CT email also will eventually make it to me as well. Um, or use that online form if you have an idea that you'd like to float by us. Um, and I'd love to talk to you, talk to you all more. Uh, and thank you again, Steve and Tony for having me here. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Well done, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.